the Small Arms Solutions Crime Gun Series. As you may or not know, I spent 10 years as a forensic scientist. I worked in the Wisconsin Department of Justice State Crime Lab in Milwaukee, as well as Monroe County Public Safety Laboratory, Crime Laboratories. And forensic firearms identification is basically working with any kind of a firearm that was used in any kind of a crime. And throughout that time period, there were several guns that came out as being top crime guns. And most of them are what you refer to as low-budget firearms, uh, ones that uh, were generally under $200. And just because of their nature of their cost, uh, they were seen quite a bit. They were, uh, they were, they were probably uh, a vast majority of what we've seen. And the first one we're going to be looking at today is the High Point. Now, the High Point has been a firearm that uh, throughout the country, um, there is a disproportionate number of those guns used. Now, I have a lot of, of experience with High Points, uh, not just from the crime lab or looking through them in crime labs, but through uh, visiting the company as well. Probably around the 2006 time period, I've had the opportunity uh, as a firearm examiner to go with uh, an ATF agent down to High Point in Ohio for a, a factory tour. And uh, I got to meet the gentleman who was behind the whole thing. His name was Tom Deebs. Now, Tom Deebs was the president of the company. Uh, he had been there. You know, He was the one that started it up. Now, Tom was a very, very interesting individual. Uh, he Honest to God felt, which I believe, that he was building firearms for those who did not have a lot of money so they could defend themselves as well. So, you know, he certainly by all means had a uh, a, a honest, a, a good reasoning behind by what he was doing uh, by making these inexpensive firearms. But the unfortunate aspect that goes along with that is there was no way to keep them out of the crime element. And Tom was very, very active in law enforcement. The, the, the major organization for firearms and tool market examiners was called AFTI, or the Association of Firearms and Tool Market Association. Now, that's, the association would have meetings every year. Tom was very active. Uh, first off, what he had done was he was one of the sponsors of the, of the association meetings. And he had done a lot of work with law enforcement to make his guns, uh, let's say, more identifiable. Uh, because he knew of the crime element. Now, the first thing he did was, as you'll see from the photograph, he has a very unique breech face on his. Uh, you know, one of the things that we identified was the breech face markings, which is the impression of the breech face, which is made on the primer for the most part of the cartridge. And as you'll see from the photograph, he would make his firing pin off center. So it would be very unique compared to anything else that was out there in the industry. And also the striations that were on there were very, very profound because what he would do is during his manufacturing process, he used a powder coat finish on the slide. So he would stick in a small sander to remove that powder coat from the breech face. Obviously, that would cause problems with feeding if he didn't. But uh, by using that belt sander on there, he would make a unique pattern every time that was very, very identifiable. So he would do that as well. His firing pins, uh, just due to the way that they were made, were very, very easily seen. They were generally a circular uh, and in the way that they were made and you know the, the impression of the marks on them and the other thing he did was because he knew it was going to the crime element and they would often what they would do is they would remove the serial numbers they would scratch them right off he'd also even put on a hidden serial number now for as far as the projectiles were concerned he did a very good job on that as well to make his very easily identifiable normally with a pistol you would have usually a six lines and grooves right hand twist type that would be very very common well what he would do is he would do for instance, on this 45 Auto JS, he would have a seven lands and grooves. He would he would he would go to a left hand twist versus the conventional right, and he would do an off number of lands and grooves seven, eight, nine. So he had one that was was nine lands and grooves right or uh, left hand twist. So his his rifling was very very easily identifiable. So when you would see the bullet, you would know from the class characteristics right away that you're looking for a high point. So, as I said, he did a lot of things to be sure that his guns were identifiable because he knew there was no way of getting those out of the crime element. So, a lot of scrutiny has come under the companies who make these low-budget guns. Uh, there's a lawsuit uh, in New York State in 2012, uh, as you may or also may not know, that during that time period, uh, the New York State courts said that you could go after a, the manufacturer and distributor of the firearms that were used in crime. So it was brought after the New York State of Appeal of the Courts decided that the gunshot victims could uh, sue both the manufacturer, which in this case would be High Point, and the sole distributor, which was MKS Supply. Uh, whether the manufacturers and distributors sold the cheap guns they knew would be popular with criminals, 
and ignored the signs of the illegal activity when dealing with the cases. Uh, High Point, High Point's response was that they make guns that are affordable. MKS was connected to selling and or trafficking and being an accomplice in hundreds of guns that ended up in use in the crime streets of Buffalo. The teen was mistaken for a gun rival and shot in 2003. He survived the gunshot wounds. The gun was traced to a gun show sale two years earlier. One of 87 guns bought by the one straw purchaser, Kim Upshaw. Her as an accomplice bought more than 181 high point pistols from MKS. One accomplice, Bostic, bought guns without an FFL, bought from MKS Supply on his personal FFL. A Bostic filled out all the 4473s. All the purchases were federally charged for illegal gun trafficking. The woman was put on probation and Bostic was seven years in prison. The lawsuit was stated with both High Point and MKS should have known that the guns Bostic bought were uh, going to end up in the hands of criminals, accessed by purchasers of multiple guns on numerous occasions, paid in cash, Selected high point nine millimeter, uh, which were normally used in crime. Uh, they have no collector's value, and all the flags of the gun dealers should have seen. The end result was that the from this lawsuit was that these guns should have been realized they were going to uh, to criminals. Uh, all the signs were there; a lot of them were missed. But the but the final real end result was that you cannot restrict the guns because of where you think they may go. Uh, there has been people who have talked throughout the years uh, through Congress uh, who want to do laws banning these cheap guns. Even one of the uh, minority leaders, Roy Innes, uh, you know, they even uh, opposed any kind of laws banning these guns because, again, you're unlawfully going after people who have low income is to buy is to purchase firearms for for defense. So, as much as uh, people know there are certain guns that are used in crime more than others, the end result is that. You cannot restrict a gun because of cost, because you have an element of society out there who does not have a lot of money. So you can't tell someone who can't afford to go out and buy a you know a five hundred dollar Glock that uh, you know unless they want to pump them and spend five hundred dollars, they can't defend themselves. Getting back to the guns in the crime lab, uh, so I've had some interesting experiences with high point pistols, you know, in casework themselves. One of the things that we would do with these guns after they would come in was you would test fire them, and what you would do is you would have the cartridge case and you have the projectile. The cartridge case we would put on a system that we would call NIBE, International Integrated Ballistic Information Network, it would take a photograph of the breech face marks, which includes the breech face and the firing pin. And it would take a digital image, put it into a computer, and the computer would correlate, and it would pull up any images that looked similar. And what this would do is enable you to track guns that were used in crime. So, for instance, we got the gun now, but uh, we may have cases you know, in the past where they were just cartridge cases, and that way we can link them together. So we would link them both based off of the firing pin impression as well as the breech face marks. Now, as we previously stated, due to the fact that high points have a unique breech face and the fact that they have an off-center firing pin, this would all make this very, very easy to see guns of the same class. And for far as the safety of the guns was concerned, this particular type of a firearm, the, you know, the entire series of the uh, high points as well as some of the other ones that we're going to talk about, for instance, the uh, the Raven 25 automatic pistols and so forth, they use the firing pin as both the firing pin as well as an ejector. So that does a couple things. First off, when it when it uh, if the firing pin breaks, it don't you know you no longer fires, of course. But uh, also the ejector can be a problem because if the pistol is to be is to be dropped, and if the slide was to go rearward uh, in, a, in a very fast motion, there's a very good chance this thing could fire out a battery because you're having the firing pin striking the cartridge case. And we actually had something like that happen in, in the laboratory in New York, where the uh, police officer claimed that there was attempted homicide or attempted murder against the uh, police officer because the gun went off. So they were going to charge this guy with, uh, you know, attempted, attempted to shoot a cop. And he said, no, no, I didn't. I dropped the gun. Well, when the gun came into the crime lab, uh, the the examiner who looked at it noticed that the cartridge case was bulged in the rear. Well, when it was bulged in the rear, that basically tells you when this thing went off, uh, the breech was not closed. The slide was not closed. So basically, when it would fire, it came down, it hit, the slide came back, the firing pin struck the primer, and it went off. And the rear of the cartridge case was not supported, so it was bulged out. And then when we received the projectile, the examiner noticed that the there was a hole a flat onto the projectile where it struck the pavement. So in the end, this gentleman did not shoot at any police officers. He dropped the firearm as the gun went off. The slide came back. Its firing pin struck the primer. The cartridge went off while the breach was still partially open, and the bullet struck the ground. So 
He did not. He, he dropped the gun and he ran. So we were able to determine that. And the, it was changed. So he, his charges was not attempted as homicide of a police officer. So no matter how, many, how bad a scumbag is, he only deserves to be charged with the actual crimes that he did. And I can't say the police were too happy about that because they really thought that he tried to kill a police officer. But due to the design of these cheaper guns that use the firing pin as an ejector, you, uh, you, you stand at risk when they're dropped of the slides coming back and the firing pin striking that, uh, that primer and setting it off. Now, the high points in general, they are, they are blowback operated pistols. So you have a massive, massive slide uh, with the weight of the slide and the spring that keeps the, the slide forward. So when you pull the trigger, the cartridge goes off and you have all this weight of the slide keeping it forward until it comes back until it's safe to extract and eject. Now, when they would come in, we often would get ones with broken firing pins. Now, we still want to put those into the Nibin system to see if we can link the gun to a crime. So we basically would take the gun apart and we would remove the uh, firing pin from a reference gun that we would have, uh, reference collection that Crown Laboratories have. So if a gun does come in and it's not operable, uh, we can get it to work. So we can get it into the system to see if it was linked to any crimes. So in this case, we would have to take the gun apart, which we were going to do. We would lock this, the slide open. You would put this on, the on a block and you have to physically drive out the pin. So first off, as we look into the firearm, you basically have a powder coated uh, finish on the barrel and you can see we have a polymer frame and it's a relatively simple type of a mechanism. So looking down the barrel, you'll see that we have a rifling twist of seven left. Now seven left is very, very, very unusual. First off, most 45 automatics will use a right hand twist and they will generally be six lands and grooves. Uh, for as far as the left hand is concerned, the only really uh, pistol that uses a left hand twist would be like a Colt 1911 or a 45. Colt's the only company that really ever use a left hand twist. With a combination of the seven left rifling twists, that basically tells you you're looking at a high point 45. Now when you look at the slide, basically we have like a like a zinc alloy type, uh, type slide on here, a lot of heavy mass. And when we pull the gun apart, you will see the firing pin. So as we see here, the firing pin, again, this is both the firing pin and the ejector. So if this was to break, you would not be able to fire. And this is what we would have in the lab. We would have uh, firing pins that were uh, out of reference guns, and we would put them in here so we can get the, the test fire out of them. So when we would run the correlation, we basically would run it only on the breech face because the firing pin obviously isn't the original one. So you would be able to identify based off of breech face only uh, without a firing pin. Then the whole process would be once we would see on the computer a match, you would have to call that evidence back and, my, and put it on the microscopes to verify the fact that it was, in fact, um, the, the same firearm. You wouldn't do that off of the computer. You would have to physically do that on a microscope. So as we spoke before, what they would do is you have a powder coat type finish on the slide. They would take this sander and they would put it right on the breech face and take it right down so you would have a unique breech face mark on every single pistol because of course every time you have the standard that hits you have modification you have the you know the standards going in multiple different directions and it would wear so you would always have a unique pattern for each and every pistol extractors were also very very common for these things to break as well uh that was because again they are not designed as basically target shooting pistols they're designed more of a self-defense type pistol this one here from being used in a crime you can also see that uh it's it's got a nice uh mark in the back from being dropped as well so for reassembly, we drop the firing pin in first. We have an embedded firing pin spring. Drop in like so. And then we would drop in the locking plate here. We're gonna insert the recoil spring and the guide rod into the polymer frame. Place it in like so. And we have to be sure that we get the post of that lock pin into the frame. Now we have the pistol back together. Now the first generation of the High Point series did not have a magazine safety. The second generation does. This happens to be the second generation. 
Now, often when these pistols would be come into the crime lab, they would have the serial numbers removed. They would use a Dremel tool and they would just grind the, the uh, serial number right off. Now, for the most part, with the use of etching acids, uh, we were able to restore these so you'd be able to see them again because of the way that uh, it uh, <clears throat> pushes together the, the molecules of the metal. And by doing that, it leaves that impression in there long after it's, it looks like it's been destroyed. By etching it down, you'd be able to see it. Now, uh, Tom Deebs did know that uh, this was going to be a problem, so he did provide a hidden serial number. And that hidden serial number, I'm not going to show you all because, because of the fact that, uh, you know, it is a hidden serial number and it's something that's good for law enforcement. So there is a hidden serial number on here as well. You're looking at heavy. This is like, this is 35 ounces. This is a very heavy pistol, and it has to be that way due to the fact that it's a blowback 45 auto. You have a massive heavy slide for it to be able to hold the, the slide closed long enough for the pressures to drop so it can uh, safely uh, extract and eject. You have an overall, overall length of 7.75 inches. Um, again, it's a, it's a big pistol. It, it has to be. Uh, the magazine capacity, you have 9 plus 1 rounds of 45 automatic ammunition. So it's, uh, you know, more, it does have more uh, rounds than a 1911, I'll give it that, uh, but single column magazine. Again, we have a black powder coat finish on it as well. It's a very, very cheap finish, but it's a very, very good finish for as far as uh, durability is concerned. But on the internal parts, it does have to be removed because it would cause friction. The sights we have on here is a three-dot sight system. Uh, so we have uh, two red in the back, and then we have a yellow in the front. Retail price, $149. You can get a 45 automatic caliber handgun for the cost of 149 bucks, which is relatively inexpensive. So it does give somebody an opportunity to have a 45 caliber handgun at a low price uh, that they normally wouldn't be able to afford. So it does do everything that Tom Deeb wanted to do it. You know, I don't believe Tom Deeb was in the business of making guns for criminals. Um, you know, once you got to know the guy, uh, you knew that what he was trying to do, but he knew there was a consequence to what he was doing. It's like anybody who makes anything that's it's designed for you know, for, for, for good, it's designed for uh, personal defense or it's designed for anything, then a criminal element could take it. You know, you're somebody who manufactures, uh, you, know, you know, knives. You know, that those knives are used to cut food. They're used for things like that. But then someone turns around and uses them as a weapon. So no matter what manufacturing process or whatever you're manufacturing, it's designed and intended for one purpose and it can always be used for another. We took it to the range. The emission that we used was the Black Hills uh, 230 grain. Full metal jacket with a muzzle velocity of 827 feet per second. So we're going to take this to the range and I'm going to show you how you shoot this properly. Now, with a pistol that's blowback operated, especially this caliber, uh, you do have quite a bit of a hefty recoil. Now, of course, the 45 automatic is very, very rare uh, as a crime gun. The most common ones are going to be the 9 millimeters. And the ammunition that we see uh, in crime labs uh, is not the high-performance hollow points. Uh, very, very rarely, in fact, do we see high-performance hollow points. Most of the ammunition used in crime guns is cheap, full metal jacket. It's whatever is cheapest they can get their hands on. The only time we generally really see uh, hollow point type ammunitions is when it was fired from a law enforcement officer who's using proper uh, ammunition. The ammunition like the gun, you're going to find the cheapest ammunition possible. Another little interesting thing that we saw with the use of the, uh, the Niven systems or the uh, National Integrated Ballistics Information Network for tracing guns uh, you know, throughout their history of crime labs is the people in jail, obviously jail, when you go in there, you're talking to other people about, hey, how'd you get caught? And they talk about the different technologies that we use to be able to do it. And in Wisconsin specifically, you would see guns go from gang member to gang member, then to different gangs. The guns basically would be circulated around. And something about crime statistics, too, that uh, is very, very interesting is you may see a lot of shooting going on in a particular location. But when you start looking at who's doing the shooting, you're going to see there's a very, very small group of individuals who are doing that shooting. So you may have one gun that we've linked up to two, three, four, five, six, eight crimes, eight to 10 crimes. Uh, I did have one pistol in particular. That one was a Glock. It was a Model 40 that we had linked that to over to over 11 crimes, I believe. They were including homicides. They were included assaults. They were called you know, reckless endangerments. And the gun was finally found under the seat of a guy during a drunk driving stop. 
Well, by the time we got that gun in and we linked it up, we saw the history of that firearm. There was uh, nothing that could be done. The guy was charged with, uh, uh, you know, DWI. So unless the district attorney could put the gun in that person's hands, even though you have a gun that was used in this wide variety of crimes, all that information is can be somewhat useless due to the fact that unless that DA can put that in the guy's hands, you can't charge him with anything. So, you know, there's a lot of really cool stuff that's done in forensics, um, especially uh, in firearms for as far as doing the, you know, tracking, uh, you know, the multiple usages of a particular firearm. But, you know, you can have all that list, but if the DA can't put it in his hands, all that, all that information is for nothing because now you have, you have the gun, you have everything that it's linked to, but no one to charge the crimes with. So that's going to be sort of the frustration, uh, you know, you know, with these guns. So as they come in, we can deal with broken guns that we're going to get to work so we can bring them through the National Integration Ballistic Information Network. Um, also, if we have crimes uh, with the projectiles, uh, now NIBIN does have a provision on it to put projectiles on it as well. Most crime laboratories find that it's not worth the time and the effort because it does not work that well, especially when bullets are, are uh, different. You know, they're, they're all banged up and you can't get proper uh, images of the lands and grooves. Some laboratories uh, will keep an open case file, which means they'll keep the bullets in a, in a cabinet. And whenever they come across a bullet, whether it comes from a medical examiner or another crime scene that meets the same class characteristics, because basically what we have in, in forensics is class characteristics. We either have they are not the same class or they're uh, the same class. And then we do for individual characteristics. So your class would be caliber, the width of the lands and grooves, the number of lands and grooves, direction, and twist. That'd be a class. And then after that, we'll look at individual characteristics, which individual characteristics would be uh, the striations, the, you know, the, the lands and grooves, those marks that are on them. And those are what's going to be identifiable. And you come to three conclusions. Positive, yes, it was fired in that firearm. Two, that it was inconclusive, or three, that it's uh, that it's negative. And uh, you would take those bullets from the open case file. You would find the ones of the same class, and then you put them under the microscope, and you would physically examine them to see if they are you know have the individual to see if they were used in that firearm or not. Most laboratories don't do that because it's not worth it. the time that goes into doing it. You may put you know five hundred man hours in to find one uh, hit with a projectile. It's generally not uh, practical. Um, if you have the you know, police report that says, you know, we're, we, we have a potential link, then you can go and pull that stuff and then it's worth it's worth the time. But the best evidence is the fired cartridge cases. And, uh, you know, Tom Deeb went out of his way to make sure that there was very, very good class characteristics on this pistol. So his stuff is very, very easily identifiable. Unfortunately, uh, Tom Deeb's had passed, uh, and instead of it being owned by B. Miller, which it was, B. Miller Incorporation, it's now owned by Haskell. Uh, so that you still have the same brand, but it's now made by Haskell Firearms. And they still remain one of the highest uh, used crime guns there is, but it obviously uh, is very small compared to the number of people who use these for legitimate uh, self-defense purposes. So, you know, the argument that you could, you need to ban these guns because they're used by mostly criminals, at the same time, you, you're, you're penalizing the honest citizen who just does not have a lot of money. And I think that's what has mostly been found, is that, uh, you know, those small, small pistols, um, as good as they are for criminals, they're used by people who can't afford a Glock or a Sig or a Beretta. I think they do have a very unique place in the market uh, amongst uh, low-income uh, end users, but... No matter how hard we try, uh, no matter how hard any, any gun industry tries, it's impossible to keep your equipment out of the hands of the bad guys. Uh, they can get it. So I hope you enjoyed our first video uh, on our crime gun series, and we'll be seeing you for our next one coming up really soon. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you do, please click like, please subscribe, and even better, share.